University, I just want to say, first of all, um, I believe this series has been so fundamental and so profoundly beautiful in the life of our church. Um, we talked first, I talked about reach, um, which was reaching. Does this always drop even before I start? <laughs> um, we started with reach. We talked about the act that we have to reach beyond our walls. Lifeguards cannot just stand on the lifeguard rack and, and just stand there. Um, they have to actually go in the water and get the people. <laughs> So reach is not just great programs we throw and invite people, but reach is actually us going to the community. Number two, number two was Sister Lori, I think, did it better than I could have last week as she spoke about care. She talked about what it means to be a caring church and what does that look like. And, and she really broke that thing down from a profoundly powerful theological perspective perspective, exegeting the text, finding the profound meanings, and lifting them out in a way that was hermeneutically sound and really beautiful, uh, making it contextually correct for all of us. That's what I got from it, y'all. <laughs> we'll be looking forward to many more of those great sermons from Sister Laurie. Amen. But I move on to the third leg of our mission statement. And uh, I forgot the first part. We talked about Redream, which is our vision statement, where we are a place for those that are tired, those that feel exiled. But the beauty of it is, is that when you get here, God will reform your dreams. He'll meet your needs, and he'll bless you. So today... We covered reach, we covered care. So what do you think I'm preaching on today? Whoa. Amen, amen. Um, I just wanted to take a different perspective on this, Robert. You know, um, usually when we get into talking about growing in Christ, we talk about the mechanics of growing, but I think I would just want to create a framework so you understand the journey of growing in Christ. So if you have your Bibles or you can look at the screen, whichever one is easier for you. We are in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Thank you, Jermaine. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? I've come to the conclusion at this point in my life that there are activities that many of us will say drain us and many of us will say will give us life again. I have come to the very clear conclusion that, for example, um, even activities that we say help us are still draining. Um, some of us are introverts and we know that going out to social engagements, even though they might be with a loved one and friends and they give us great memories, it's still, I need some time to recharge my social battery. Some of us go on vacation and, and we get back from, we, we tour beautiful cities in Europe and Asia and Africa. We go on the tour, we see all the great things and we get back from vacation and already booking a vacation to recover from the vacation. You know, some of us go to Disney World and take, we take a thousand steps every day, but we get to Disney and think 15,000 a day is a good move. I don't know about you, but that's probably not a good up ramp. Um, but, you know, some of us will even go and exercise. I, I want to encourage you, exercise is, is good for you, but exercise can also drain us. I've never seen anybody leave the gym after an hour of really working out going, I feel good. 
You know, I don't, I, that, that's not exercise if you're coming out more boppy than you went in. You haven't worked anything out, you know. You, you come out, you, you're breathing hard, and, and, it, and it hurts your body. I mean, but I think exercise is a great example of something that you do that has a positive impact on it. You know, for many of us, we will say, you know, I exercise because it is good for my physical health. It slows down aging, and it's scientifically proven that if you work out exercise, it will arrest some of the issues of aging. And when I exercise, it gives me better mental health. Uh, it helps my cognitive function, cognitive function, so my mind is clearer to think and work. Also, um, because it takes so much out of you, your sleep quality improves because you exercise. If you got if you got insomnia, go run around the block. I guarantee you come back. You ain't got insomnia no more. You go right to bed. And it also helps your just general everyday energy level. And people will exercise with almost a religious. Um, fervor, where they will be at the gym Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, they'll go on a hike on Saturday, and Sunday they'll be like, it's my rest day. Rest in my house day. <laughs> and what I find interesting is that everything about exercise arrests or addresses something, but it doesn't advance me much more. It is only limited by my internal capacity to be in shape. But I want to say that many people underestimate the benefit of growing in Christ. I'm telling you right now that growing in our faith, growing in Christ, or third leg, why is it our third leg? Because it is the best thing I know that will equip you for today, tomorrow, and forever. Many people will say, I need this, this, and that. And sometimes I say, you just need to get closer to Jesus. What are some of the benefits of my faith? There is a profound emotional support. They actually say people that are believers in faith, that are Christians, will live longer than non-believers. Even those that exercise. I'm telling the truth. It's, it's the, this is research. I didn't write the research. They wrote the research. Because of the emotional support that happens, because it gives you peace, stability, and reduces stress. And you start looking at the world uh, from a sense of hope and positivity. One of the things that I've come to realize as a believer in Christ is that I can't be negative all the time. If you oh, are still a believer in Jesus, I'm going to give you some steps in a few minutes that's going to help get you out of your negative funk. I'm not saying that you are not going to face problems. You're not going to lose loved ones. You're not going to have issues at the job. You're not going to shit. That's not what I am saying. But what I'm saying is that you don't live in your pain forever. It doesn't become your lifestyle, your crutch, or the thing that drives you. Um, you know, there are days I, I started this new habit. Um, it, it does my soul good. I used to listen to books to go to sleep. I grew up in New York City. The noise from the streets always kept me up. So I wear headphones so that headphones were noise canceling. So I don't hear it. It's something I grew up doing, and now I do it every night. But I started listening to my Bible every night. You'll be amazed waking up in the morning after you've been hearing the Bible all night. Even though I'm not awake, I feel holy in the morning. I just start floating through the house. I'm happy. I start smiling. I'm like, they're like, what happened? I was like, I just had an experience in my midnight. No, um, God, but it just sets me different. It gives me moral and ethical guidance. Now, let me tell you something. When you don't have to figure out what's right is right and wrong is wrong, it saves you a lot of mental energy. 
If you got to make up the rules and decide how the rules go every day of your life, it starts becoming a problem. This is why we have people that will go crazy when they get resources and money because they start making up rules. You start hearing about them. It's like hearing about Drake on, no, I'm not gonna talk about that this morning. <laughs> you know, Kendrick Lamar, we started talking about what happens when you make up your own rules, praying for the brother Drake this morning. It helps you cope with adversity. <laughs> cope with adversity. Uh, faith, you know, because this is the one thing I do know. Don't laugh. Lucilla, don't laugh at the pastor. Somebody just said, asked me what I thought about it, so I got curious and started listening more and more and more. Uh, no, so, but coping with adversity. One of the interesting things that I, I didn't have insight to is doing funerals and seeing how believers and unbelievers deal with the adversity of death. I, I, I see a strong, not that they're not sad, not that they're not grieving, but there's a strong gravitas inside of a believer when they're dealing with a loved one passing when I see hysteria from others rolling onto the pew, rolling onto the coffin, rolling, chasing the coffin out the building, laying, like, I've seen some things in my time. That's why I only do funerals now for members and people who attend the church. Because our faith allows us to cope with adversity, and it also gives us purpose and fulfillment. Uh, uh, you, I, my purpose doesn't come from my position, doesn't come from my money, doesn't come from my resources, doesn't come from my degree. It comes from my relationship with Jesus and how he has a plan for my life. So no matter which room, which table, who has what um, in the room, um, I don't feel uh, put up on, I don't feel, because I'm living in my purpose. Somebody said to me, Pastor Smith, we're going to this meeting. This man's a billionaire. I'm like, okay, cool. Why, what does that mean to me? My, my father created a billion stars. Different attitude when you start dealing with God. Because growing in Christ feeds our soul, refreshes our spirits, and prepares us for life. As we look at this text this morning, we're looking at the book of Peter um, as it starts, and Second Peter starts Simon Peter, um, the apostle Peter, um, the hard-headed one. And what I find interesting about the author of this text is that he writes this thing out in a very process-based way. And I wonder, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using my holy imagination here, and some theologians believe because he had to go through a process of growing in his faith that he can clearly understand and explain to us what growing in faith looks like. What we have here is eight different things or eight different steps or eight, a ladder with eight steps that talks about our growth in faith. And what I find interesting that at the beginning of the ladder, it starts with faith, and at the end, it ends with love. And what is interesting is faith is the root of all the virtues, all the things that we need. We need faith to begin with, but love is the goal of Christianity. So there's a process that we go through. Let me give you a few, the few pieces that he talks about. He talks about faith. This is the first one. He talks about virtue as the second one. He talks about knowledge as the next one. He talks about self-control as, as the next one. And then he talks about steadfastness. He talks about godliness. And then he talks about brotherly affection. That's a lot to remember. So I want to help you out this morning by giving you a way and taking you on the journey of constructing a house. Each of these steps are analogous to the parts that you build in a house. If we start at the foundation, faith is the foundation of all we do. 
as somebody said to me, um, Pastor Smith, I, I don't have perfect faith. None of us have perfect faith. I once heard it defined by a preacher that faith is believing 51%. Somebody says, Pastor Smith, that don't sound too sure. I'm like, you believe more than you don't. That's faith. I believe God is real. I believe he can do it more than I don't believe he can do it. You know, and I think when we all start this journey, and when we all say, I accept Jesus, when I all say, I join the church, when we all say, I recommit, we start off with only faith. It is only the sense that it's, I believe, more than I don't. The beauty of faith is that as you go through this process, Faith is like concrete. It starts setting and firming and becoming more stronger. How, how do I know that? Um, because it's been my experience that my faith has grown the more I've grown in Christ. Because I've seen the evidence of him in my life, and I've seen the evidence of what he does in my life. So when I start saying I believe in Christ, when I came down the aisle at 27, 28, just out of rehab, giving up substances, all I knew was that on the other side, Jesus is better. I am now 20 years down the line, and I've seen him provide more than I know I ask. And what I do know is this, is that that God has walked with me, so my foundation has gotten firmer in my faith because I've walked with him. The next framework, you know, you got to build some frames. If you ever look at a house, you'll see they build the foundation. The next thing they do is they build the framework where they take the two by fours and start putting it 16 on center. Did I get it right, Rick? Did a 16 on center with the studs. They put the header in to make sure that the next floor does. They're building a frame that's going to hold the building up. That's virtue. Virtue forms the structure of our character, shaping and supporting what we do. Listen, um, you know, C.S. Lewis, um, in his book, Mere Christianity, talked about the idea of the numinous, which is that there are universal things no matter what faith you are in that are wrong. Lying, stealing, cheating, murder. We all, because it's all of us, are built inside of us this sense of what right or wrong is. Now, I live in America today and realize that um, people um, don't listen to that in inside sense. Some people might listen to Fox News. <laughs> people will listen to, to, to the outside things, but I believe all the humans know what's right or wrong. Part of when we start in our faith journey is knowing what's right or wrong in our life. I might not be able to point the verse that says don't, but I know I shouldn't. That's my framework. That's where I start saying, you know what, I'm going to be different because I'm now in a relationship. I feel Jesus in my life. And what I'm doing right now is doing what I know is right and what's not wrong. You know, one of, one, one of the hardest things, hardest things, still hard, so hard, is I, I know I should shut my mouth. I, I, I suffer from it. Look at my job. And I'm learning now in my life that I don't have to say everything I think. Because... Because that's where virtue comes in. Sometimes virtue is keeping my mouth closed. Sometimes virtue is showing up. Sometimes virtue is letting it slide. Letting it slide. Because um, I'll get to knowledge, but they said if, if, you, if, you, got, if you think I got um, a splinter in my eye, but you got the board, you probably shouldn't tell me what I'm doing wrong. Or maybe I should go the other way because I have a board and you have a splinter. I shouldn't. T you you get the point. 
God starts giving us inclinations in our journey of what's right and what's wrong. Maybe I shouldn't go here. Not because it's evil, not because it's bad, because I believe most environments are neutral, but because it brings out the evil and bad in me. I'm sick of a world that, that we try to tell everybody what to do instead of monitoring our own behavior. God said, I'm in charge of me, not woman, not other people. Why don't I monitor my behavior? So that's virtue. The next thing is the walls. That's knowledge. When we start putting up the walls, if you've ever seen sheet rockers lay, they lay it one piece at a time. That's one verse at a time. That's reading the verse, knowing the verse, living the verse, reading the verse, knowing the verse. Okay. Building the wall, building the wall. The interesting thing that I, I've learned is that when you put up a wall, it's not just drilling in the sheetrock. Now you got to take it. So you're going over the same thing you just went over. Then you got to mud it. Then you got to sand it. Then you got to prime it. Then you got to sweat sand it again. Then you got to paint it again. Then you got to put another coat of paint on it. And you got then you put your fixtures on it. What am I trying to say? Your knowledge of God is not just a one time I read a verse. There are verses that I go over today that every time I read them, I go, why didn't I see that before? Because God continues to give me more revelation as I build the wall of this house. And so many of us will think, well, I read it once and nothing's changed. No, no, keep reading because you, all you did was screw on the sheetrock. You need to take the joints. You need to mud the wall. You need to paint it. And sometimes you need help. That's why you go to small groups. That's why you do Bible study. Um, 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 the Alcoholics Anonymous has a book that talks about spiritual disciplines. And they say one of the greatest ways to be delusional is to do spiritual activities by yourself. I've heard some delusional people in my life, and they usually start, well, I heard a voice. So where, were you, where did you learn? Where did they teach? No, I just heard a voice. Okay. Next is insulation. The insulation is added to keep the elements out and to maintain the environment within. That's self-control. Self-control protects me more than it harms me. You know, many people will say, well, you know, the Christians, they don't do this, they don't do that, they don't do this, they don't do that. And I remember being one of those people. I remember being 25, 26, going out, going to club, drinking, you know, staying out all night. And, and at 47, what I realized is this, is that what I was doing was unsustainable even if I never changed my faith. The many of the things that the world will tell you that you shouldn't have self-control around are unsustainable and destructive by the end of the process. The world will convince you that having self-control or being a believer is something that is robbing you instead of something that's protecting you. So many people don't understand that, like, the world is going, the devil's a liar. Let me start there. The devil has no significant power except lies and deceit. So the greatest lie he will tell you is that things that you need to have self-control for, you shouldn't have self-control for. You don't need to do. 
Treat yourself. Go there. It ain't that bad. Who knows? Why should I? I earned it. I deserved it. It's mine. Who knows later? And then you look back over your life and you see so many missed opportunities because you never maintained the spiritual temperature inside. That's what that insulation does. Keeps out those influences. You know, people say, like, what's like self-control? Like showing up to church. I know it sounds simple. But when I enter into a space with other believers, it starts changing how I see the world. Going to small group and talking. You know, when I started small group, I started small groups because I said we needed to have better discipleship. I look forward to small groups now because the conversations enrich my soul. Even though it's based on my sermon that I wrote and studied for, by the time I get to small group and hear other people, it grows me. It encourages me. It starts expanding me. And I wrote it. That's like having the daily prayer life. That's like telling, teaching your kids to pray. It's like being in spaces with other believers. Those things help us keep the world out in its sinful nature. The next thing is steadfastness. Ooh, I got to hurry up. Um, steadfastness. Um, my best friend, um, and he's not wrong, um, has accused me of hobby hopping. Nick DiClemente has known me since my mid-twenties. And in that time, I've done photography, RC cars, AV, like I've had, I got a ton of hobbies. Um, I have been loyal to none of them. Oh, I have been loyal to sneakers. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. But the one thing I've been loyal to is my faith. Because my steadfastness in my faith has allowed me to push through and have perseverance. It shields me from the storm of life and ensures, despite the trials and temptations, I don't wear out. That's why steadfastness is like a root. It keeps out the stuff on the outside. Sometimes when I, sometimes I will look at my wife, I was like, I don't know how we're going to get through this situation. And she's like, we're going to do it the same way we did it the last time. Let's just take one step and pray. Take two steps and pray. Takes three steps and pray. We're just going to hold on to God's truth. He didn't bring us this far to keep us from failing. Some of the stuff you hear me saying up here, it's not for you, it's for me. Because I need God to be steadfast in my life. The next thing is, is, is the interior. And I'm rushing now because I got to get to the finish line and still do communion and other stuff, is the interior. That's godliness. This is about our private devotion and public actions that reflects God's holiness in our life. We ought to act different than the rest of the world. I can't be involved in every conversation. I can't use every word everybody else does. I can't go everywhere everybody else goes. Like, like my brother, he had a bachelor party. He had three bachelor parties, as a matter of fact. Three. One in New York, one in Montreal, four. One in Vegas, and one in Thailand. And you know which one I got invited to? None. And he, and he said, and, 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 and I go, and I go to him, I felt, I was offended. He was like, you're not going to be no fun where we are going. You too holy for where we going. <laughs> I, I, I was hurt. And then I walked away and I started thinking about it. I was like, my brother, he, he, he's one of my best friends. We, We've been doing this for years, and he's seen such a change in my life. We, we, I took him to his first nightclub. 
And 15 years later, he's like, nah, you can't come to the club with me. That's what the interior of my life looks like, godliness. You know, don't, don't get mad when your friends don't call and invite you certain places. Don't get offended. You don't belong there, and you showed you don't belong there because of how you act and you live. I'm going to give the example. Um, um, if you're seriously dating and married, don't hang out with single people. Wait, I'm going to answer this. I'm going to answer this. I'm going to get to it. Let me fix it. Because uh, you can have single, listen to, listen to me, you can have single friends. But single people are looking for partners. So they're going to do activities that require you to go to places where everybody is looking for a partner. You have a partner at home. Why are you out here with other people looking for partners? Because by being there, you are declaring, I'm looking for a partner. Nobody know. You might have a ring on, but people don't pay attention to the ring anymore. They think it's jewelry. <laughs> it's not a sign anymore. It's jewelry. Somebody, somebody, said, you, somebody looked at me the other day and said, you've got two nice rings on. What are they? I'm like, this is my wedding ring. <laughs> and it's my exercise track. Oh, that's nice. Okay, yes, let's move on. Um, but, but you get what I'm saying. You can have single friends. Y'all could go for coffee, go for the wine bar, whatever. But you can't go to places where people are looking for partners and you have a partner at home. Make sense? I told y'all. Like, y'all looking at me like I'm crazy or something. All right, decor. That was interior garland, but the decor... And this is something I have to say, is love. Now, I really struggled with this because every church says they're a loving church. And I'm like, what does that mean? What does it mean you're a loving church? Who do you love? And then you meet somebody new, how do you know you love them? And I love how, 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 how Paul, uh, Peter breaks it down. He says, he starts with brotherly affection, which is me meeting you and being with you and being in community with you. I gain an affection or a liking for you. I was talking to a new member. I said, we we're a very friendly and a very nice church. He goes, yes. I don't use the word loving because I we don't, haven't gotten that far yet. We have to stop using important words in cheap ways. I have a profound brotherly affection for all of God's creation. I will care for them. I will walk with them. I will be with them. I will hang out with them. But I can't just use the same word I used to describe the relationship with my wife and my mother for everybody. Even as we grow larger, there's going to be a lot of new people. And, and there is a lot of new people, but people have different relationships. So you all might be closer to somebody, and you have a profound love for them, but I need everybody to have a brotherly affection for each other. Because I want us to be real and not butcher the English language. So many people... They get into church, and they start saying, well, we love everybody. No, you don't. You barely said hi to the pastor coming in, and you skipped over the other one, or the other two people to go to your friend. And that's not this church. I saw it at somebody else's church. <laughs> but we should have brotherly affection and be, and be real with each other and have brotherly love. But not be like, oh, I love everybody. No, you don't. I'm not going to let you lie in God's house. I'm not going to let you hurt somebody because you positioned yourself as loving everybody. And then because of the realities of life, relationships, and human interaction, 
you can't deliver on that word. But it's good in your spiritual journey to be like, how do, because I'm following God, I have a brotherly affection for everybody, and I, then I grow deeper with a certain group, and I can give love in that group. I have, I have, I have, I have two friends. I talk to them every week. We talk every week, every week, sometimes three, four times a week. Um, Reverend um, Julius Wall and Reverend Walter Grossberg. We, we started this journey together 15 years ago. Seven, wow, 15. Wow, I've been doing this longer than I thought. 17 years ago <laughs> together, and we pray and we, with family issues and death and, and kids crazy. We've been walking. I can say I love those brothers because we've taken this journey together for 17 years. But I need us to be honest with each other and say, do we desire a church that has a loving environment? Yes, but that loving environment is shown in our brotherly affection. And that means everybody deserves to be shown some level of brotherhood, affection, attention, and recognition in the building. Amen. So let me sum this up for you guys. I want to imagine you set out on a climb to a mountain. This mountain is not just any mountain, but it represents your journeys of faith. You stand at the bottom and you look up. As you start climbing on this journey, the first step you take is a step of faith because you don't know if you are ever going to um, reach the top. As you start climbing, as many people know in mountains, you go through foothills first. So your first foothills sometimes are very smooth and easy. But as you start getting further and higher up, you reach some very steep slopes that start messing with you and you start having to climb these steep slopes. That's your virtue. That's you asking to have strong moral character in the face of steep slopes in your life. As you get to the top of the steep slope, you end up in a rocky path, and that rocky path has stones and boulders and all, uh, all the things that are in the way, and it starts messing with you, and you start saying, I don't know, I'm twisting my ankle. But what those rocky paths are is that you are building knowledge on how to navigate through difficult situations through the use of Scripture. As you get to the end of the narrow path, of the rocky path, you end up in a narrow ledge. You have to go one foot in front of the other and just shimmy across. You've got to take the narrow path, and that is your self-control going through difficult times because if you step left or right, you fall off. But if you have self-control, you stay right on that narrow path. As you go and it's getting late and dark, you start having storms, but you say, I am on my way to the mountaintop. So that as you go through the harsh conditions, that's your steadfastness leading you through that. But as you get to the top and as you get closer. You feel alone. You feel solitude. Everybody that was at the bottom of the mountain is not there with you. But in that solitude, you start hearing a still, quiet voice. You start having godliness in your life. You start having quiet moments of reflection and prayer as you are walking to the mountaintop. And all I know is that that's godliness in your life. But as you turn the corner, you see another climber climbing with you. And you say, where are you going? They say, I'm going to the mountaintop. And that is that brotherly affection because you don't have to take the journey alone. It might not be the people you thought at the beginning of the journey with you, but as you go with 
God, he will give you unexpected companions that will give you brotherly affection. And right now, as you approach the summit, you start experiencing love. That final push to the peak requires a burst of love, the purest mountain, to keep going when the end is at sight because you are only now reflecting what Jesus has done in your life, which is love somebody so deeply and profoundly that you are willing to sacrifice and give it all for them. That is what the love of Jesus will do for you. And now we are all on the mountaintop. And as you stand at the summit, celebrating with those that have climbed with you, you reflect on how each step, each virtue added to your faith and made this, gen this journey possible. This celebration of growing in Christ is both a personal and a personal and a community thing. Don't think that it's just boring stuff. It's the stuff that gets you ready to have the victory. I just know that if there's anybody in here that wants to be victorious, you have to grow in Christ. And I just ask that you would just wave your hand and say, in 2024, 2025, 2026, I'm going to grow with Jesus. And I'll be right there at the mountaintop cheering for you and say, there there goes a victorious man and woman of God living out their life. So let's have the victory, university. May we all stand. We're going to have conversations, a lot of conversations, and it will always be an ongoing conversation about growing in Christ and the methods that you do that. But I wanted to give you the journey because sometimes when you're in the journey, you could be on that narrow path. You could be on the rocky path. You could be on the ledge and it's overwhelming, but I just want to let you know it's part of your journey and that you've got to trust God in that space. University, I want to open the doors right now. And it's going to be simple. 